have a program that looks like this. Actually, there's two shades of yellow, this shade or another shade. Raise your hands, and the bearded woodsman will grant you one free of charge. Thank you. Up here in the front. Thanks, Tom. Uh, my heart is full. I hope yours is too. And um, while Tom continues to pass those out, Tom over here, you missed Dan Lahut. Oh, sorry, you're okay. You're saving him for last. He's coming, Dan. Somebody's beeping. That's the perfect timing. It says the time to start the sermon. But we're going to start with prayer. We would be remiss not to after that video. Lord, thank you. How can we say thank you for what you've done for us? It says in your word that your love is incomprehensible. And Lord, we may this morning, some of us, be overwhelmed with our own personal needs, whether it be health, financial, emotional, or something else. And maybe that's all we can see, like a dark cloud. I pray, God, that you would lift our spirits up, that we would be lifted above our problems and get a glimpse again of who you are and be reminded of your great glory and your holiness and that you are God and you are good and your promises are true no matter how we may be feeling. So this morning, let our hearts be open to hear what you're saying and fill us up with new joy and praise that we might just say, thank you, God. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Uh, this morning, um, Terry Karen here came up to me and said, she said, I'm greedy this morning. Really, she was saying she was greeting, but it was funny because it sounded like she said she's greedy, so we laughed about that on the morning that I'm going to give a message on giving. <laughs> it's the first time I've ever preached on the topic of giving, and I have been hesitant because the last thing I want to do is stand up here and say, give us your money, because that's not what we're saying at all. And if you listen to what I'll share, I think that will be clear that we're not simply asking you for your money. And there's a running joke in our family, at least with my younger sister, Karen, who lives in San Diego, and her and her family go to one of the big, huge mega churches. It's built on one of the uh, small mountains in San Diego, a multi-million dollar campus. And it's a great church, and they preach the gospel there, and there's great leadership, um, and they love it there. It's the same church that John Maxwell started, those of you heard of him, and another pastor took over about 15 years ago. And they continued to go there. And while they were in the building process, um, they would do an annual sermon on giving to, for their giving campaign. And as fate would have it, when um, I would visit and when my wife Jessica and I would visit, I don't think she went with me every time, I would happen to go visit my sister on the Sunday that they preached on giving. I've only gone there two or three times, and every sermon was on giving. I never heard a regular sermon. And so uh, my sister still jokes with me about that. So if you're a guest here, we don't preach on giving very often. In fact, it's the first time I've given a message on giving. I want to start off with uh, a perspective on money. A perspective on money, if you're following along in your notes, it's the first dollar sign. A perspective on money. Before we talk about giving, we have to talk about money. What is money? Well, I took my wallet out, so I didn't have any um, hindrance in my pockets when I come up to preach. So I don't have any money right now. But what is money? Pieces of paper and pieces of metal, in and of itself, it has no inherent value. But it can be used in a transaction if you're in the right country. I have money from other countries that is worthless to me here unless I were to travel to that country. It's just pieces of paper. And yet people kill and die and fight for money. Uh, why is that? Well, I think it's clear when you look at Matthew 6.24. 
I'm going to give you several uh, verses here, and you can see them in your program. So if you want to thumb ahead and have your finger ready for the next one, that's up to you. Um, or if you want to just listen, or if you want to follow along in your Bible, I invite you to do it however you want. But the first one is Matthew 6.24. Money is master or servant. Money is either going to master you or be your servant. And this is one of those Bible verses that you've heard before. But let's maybe look at it in a different uh, light. And we'll try to unpack these verses for you as we go along. So Matthew 6.24 says, No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Period. End of statement. Jesus said it. Now, there's no exceptions. Um, everybody thinks they're the exception, right? Um, we can't be our own master. People think that they can master themselves and nothing will master them. No matter how hard we try, everybody is going to be mastered by something. For some, it's money. Only Jesus Christ has the power and the authority to be master and Lord of your life. Completely. And the strength and the weaponry to protect your heart from evil would-be usurpers. I really wanted to say the word usurpers this morning. Because other things want to usurp that control. Whatever uh, uh, is on the throne of your life, you, yourself, or money, and if it's money, it's really you, because you're trying to hang on to something else, something's going to try to come along and usurp that, and it's not going to be a good thing. Jesus says um, he wants our life. He doesn't just want to have your Sunday. And we've talked about that before. Let's go back and listen to those messages about surrender and giving ourselves fully to him. But Jesus has the power and authority to back this up and be your master, so that money won't master you. And many people are mastered by money. Money is their uh, master. It's what they live for and what they die for. And then they find out too late it wasn't worth it. Now, Jesus backs up this truth with a sad and sober parable about a rich guy. In the next verse, Matthew 19.21. If you flip ahead in Matthew. The backdrop here is that there's a rich man that comes to Jesus and says, oh, hey, uh, Jesus, um, I know you're this really wise teacher guy, and um, hey, what do I need to do to, you know, be perfect and go to heaven? Jesus plays along with his game, his religious game, and says, all right, um, you need to, and then he gives him several of the Ten Commandments. And the guy says, I've done all these all my life. What else do I need to do? Jesus said in verse 21 of Matthew 19, if you really want to be perfect, now go sell what you possess, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come and follow me. How many of you can put yourself in the place of this rich man and imagine yourself responding with, really? That's all I need to do? I can just sell everything I have, give it away, and then come and follow you? Really? You'll let me follow you? Yes, I'm in. Is that what he did? It says he went away sad because he was very wealthy. Implication? He could not let it go. He could not let go of his wealth. It was too important to him. Why? Because it was his master. And there wasn't room for Jesus too. It's very sad. Does this mean that we have to sell everything we have to follow Jesus? 
Any of you have a bank account? A house? Money in your pocket? How dare you? Give it all away. No. Obviously, that's not what the message is here. See, Jesus knew the man's heart. So Jesus knew that money mastered him. And he needed to let go. And break the chains of the grip that money held on him. And um, we'll talk more about, a little bit later, about whether or not it's possible to be rich and follow Christ. It's very hard. Okay, look, let's contrast that now with the other extreme. Uh, sell. He told that guy to sell everything and give it to the poor and follow him. He couldn't do it. Uh, Luke 12. Matthew, Mark, Luke, three chapters ahead. Luke chapter 12 is another a story of a man who had a lot of stuff. This is a very successful farmer. In Luke 12, starting in verse 13. Luke 12, 13. Actually, I'm going to start at verse 16. Luke 12, 16. And Jesus told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. Tom and Matt and all you guys at farm, you always pray and dream of the land producing plentifully, right? That's what farmers want. Well, this is uh, land produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I know what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones. I always wondered why he did, didn't add on. Tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. Verse 20. But God said to him, Fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. I think the key there is rich toward God. What was this man's problem? Was it that he tried to store up more stuff? Is it wrong to build a bigger barn or a bigger bank account or a bigger room addition, or a bigger pole barn. We just built a pole barn because our barn was too small. Was that wrong? Or our shed, was that wrong to do? No, the problem here is that he was depending, he was putting his faith in his stuff and saying, now I can relax and depend on my stuff and not have to work and not have to trust God for anything for a while. I'm good. I can coast. That was his problem. It wasn't the amount of stuff he had. It was his attitude toward it. It mastered him. It controlled him. It was his God. And there was no room for the living God to trust in him and have faith. But let's make it clear. Money is not evil. 1 Timothy 6.10 One of the most misquoted verses in the Bible. Maybe you've done it yourself by accident. Can't tell you how many times I've corrected people on Facebook. I've heard or seen that money is the root of all evil. No, it isn't. The Bible doesn't say that. What does it say? The love of money is the root of all kinds of evils, it actually says. The love of money. Money itself is neutral. Now, it's not in and of itself good either. It's just inherently neutral. It's a tool. It's a thing. Like a shovel or a hammer. It's a tool. Money is a tool if we have the right attitude toward it. But the love of money, if it masters you, if it's the center of your life, it will be the root of evil. It goes on to say, It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. And again, everyone thinks they're the exception. 
Everyone thinks, oh, if I win the lottery. How many of you at some point in your life have thought that? Be honest. I did when I was younger. I don't play the lottery, but I always thought, oh, I would do so much good with it. Right? Um, They've done surveys on people that have won the mega lottery. Many of them are miserable and wish they'd never won the lottery because their lives were ruined and ripped apart. Everyone thinks they're the exception, though. Let me tell you something. If you're not faithful with the little you have now to give it to God, you're not going to give it to him if you have millions. You're going to be like Terry and be greedy. (laughs) You were greeting. Just make it clear. Not greedy. It's still funny, though. Money will never satisfy. Do you hear me? Money will never satisfy. Ecclesiastes 5.10 He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. Let's just make it clear right now, money will never satisfy. Let's look now at giving, a perspective on giving. We've talked a little bit about money. Now we need to spend the rest of our time talking about giving. I've titled the message, giving the key to great gain. Let's try to figure out why that's true and if it's true. God's economy. We're going to look at Luke 21. This is a very interesting passage. The backdrop here, as you're turning to Luke 21, see, in the temple area, uh, the the, the temple in Jerusalem that was still there when Jesus walked on the earth, this large temple area, there was several courts, these outer courts. And there was one of the outer courts called the Court of Women. And it wasn't called the Court of Women because only women could be there or had anything special for them. It just meant they couldn't go any further. They weren't allowed to go to the next court toward the Holy of Holies at that time. And so it was called the Court of Women. And around that, um, there was like a colonnade there and there was this, uh, walls around it, there was these boxes. They were collection boxes. And there was 13 of them. I did some studying on the temple. 13 of them. And they had an opening that was wide at the top where you drop money in. And it went narrow. It looked like a trumpet. So you get the saying, uh, blowing your trumpet or blowing your own horn, blowing your trumpet. Look at me, you know, the rich man that wanted everyone to know he gave money. We call that blowing your trumpet when you draw attention to yourself. And so... Uh, Sometimes people would want to be seen putting their offering into this trumpet or offering box. So there's 13 of them, and Jesus is sitting there or standing with some of his disciples, and he's watching people. You ever watch? Do people watching? Jesus is people watching. I wonder if they knew who was watching. And there's, it says, in verse, uh, starting in verse 1 of Luke 21, it says, Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. But then in verse 2, and he saw a poor widow put in two, two small copper coins. And he said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Let's go back and look at this for a moment. Uh, It says the poor widow put in two small copper coins. Sometimes they'll say mites. Uh, Mite was, um, the actual Greek word is lepton. Lepton is a very, very small coin. It was actually one 128th of a denarius. So take a denarius. You've heard of that. That's a, a coin in wide use in Roman times. It was considered a day's wage for a common laborer, a denarius. Now, a lepton or a mite or this small coin was worth 128. So divide a denarius 128. So it would be kind of like our penny today. Less than a penny, in a sense. Um, In fact, two mites, which it says she put in, two, 
two small copper coins or two mites would be about equivalent to our penny. So she put in about two half pennies. That would be sort of the equivalent for us today. Now, let's, let's do a little math. Let's assume that a rich guy put in $1,000. That would be a lot back then. That would be a lot now. Puts in $1,000 in the offering plate, and the widow gave a penny, a penny. Who gave more? It's a trick question. Monetarily, obviously, the rich guy, $1,000, that's more, shows up more on the budget sheet. You know, that's nice now and then. Helps pay for pole barns and things. But Jesus said that the widow gave more. Well, let's try to figure this out. Um, I did a little calculation. What, let's imagine that uh, Bill Gates, one of the richest men, he goes back and forth with Warren Buffett. Let's say Bill Gates, richest man in the world. Um, let's assume he's worth about $60 billion. I think it's actually higher right now. It depends on the stock market. But we'll say $60 billion. I figured out that if he were to write us a check for $100,000, it would be point zero 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 one seven of his full fortune. Did I say that right? That's five zeros. Point zero 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 one seven. That's the fraction of his fortune that would be represented by $100,000. Um, it would be equivalent to, um, let's, say, um, let's say, Doug, I'll pick on you because you're sitting there. Let's say you get a gift of $6,000, free and clear. And out of that $6,000, you want to give back to the church. And so you put a penny, a penny in the offering plate. That would be the equivalent of Bill Gates giving 100000 out of his fortune. <laughs> no, you're not greedy. Terry's greedy. <laughs> now, note that Jesus did not condemn the gifts of the rich. He didn't condemn them. He didn't say they're greedy or they should have given more. No, the question is not about how much they gave. It was about the percentage of their income. It was that the widow gave all that she had. So who is more blessed? The widow is more blessed. I went on a mission trip, Jenna, back when I was in um, college. I went to Kenya in Africa, and I raised uh, money through my church and family and friends. And I'll never forget um, this lady that came to our church and she was a handicapped lady and she couldn't get around very easily depending on the weather so she couldn't always be there and she called me and said I have something I love that you're going on this trip I really want to give you something she said I'm kind of embarrassed it's kind of small and but I can't get to church and I can't get it to you could you stop by and pick it up I said sure I'd love to so I went by and she with shaking hands wrote out a check to me for two dollars and fifty cents God bless her. And I thought of this parable as she handed me the check. She handed it to me almost like she was ashamed. And I just poured into her and said, Oh, bless you. Thank you so much. God will multiply your gift. And God, I, wanted to, I don't know how he blessed her, but he sure blessed me. It was like he took that $2.50 and just multiplied it over and over and over again. It was like investing in Microsoft in 1980. And I was blessed. I trust that she was blessed. And I, I saw her as that poor widow putting in her two mites. Her $2.50. And I had a wealthy man gave me a large amount of money, but it was out of his abundance. And I praise God for him. God used that. But it was not even a sacrifice for him. She put in more than all the others. You see, when you give that way, God will multiply that gift and there's a blessing attached to it. That's not tangible and easily measurable. Motives matter, in other words. The next section in your outline, motives matter. 2 Corinthians, we're going to flip to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 for this one. This is a good one to follow along if you have your Bibles. I hope you always bring your Bibles to church. Uh, if that's not your habit, I encourage you to make it your habit. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 
You've heard about the cheerful giver. We're going to look at the cheerful giver here again. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 6. Verse 6, 2 Corinthians 9. The point is this, it says in my ESV. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. That word bountifully means with blessings. With blessings is the literal meaning. When you reap with blessing or the intention of blessing, or I want to bless and I want to be blessed, it's that motive of blessing. I want to bless you. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give. Are you listening? Now we're getting to the giving stuff here. Each one must give as he or she has decided in his heart. I underlined that phrase. What's the implication? It means you thought about it, right? As opposed to the other end of that uh, spectrum, coming to church, having not even given a single thought to what you're going to put in the offering plate, and their plate comes around, oh, oh, I should put something in and throw something in without any thought. It says, give as he has decided in his heart. Careful thought, prayer, it's an act of worship. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. See, there's a limit. We all have a limit. If I give this much, I can be cheerful, 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 not so cheerful. Let's leave it right here. I don't know what that line is for you. That's between you and God. But it says God loves a cheerful giver. So I want you to be a cheerful giver. Not because I want you to give more money to the church, because I want you to be cheerful and be blessed. Motives matter. Verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times. Pause there. What's the Greek word for all? All. He is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. How does God give to the poor? He gives through us when we give. Verse 10, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Whoa, wait a minute. That says that God not only supplies the harvest, but he supplies the seed that we plant to get the harvest. Interesting, isn't it? Verse 11. I want you to underline that. Circle or something. Right in your margin. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. Let's look at that again. Verse 11. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. What's that saying? God wants to bless you to bless others. You ever heard the saying, you can't outgive God? I'd qualify that statement, motives matter. We do it with the right intention to worship him. With faith, you can't outgive God. And this principle of giving, if we had time to show you testimonies. There was a man in Kentucky, a lawyer I read about, that said that money was gradually controlling him. It was becoming his master and he was drifting away from God. Can't serve two masters. Remember that? He knew, he saw he was drifting away from God. So 
he learned about this principle and he decided to try it out and so he started to give generously. God gave him more. Then he gave more. Then God gave him more. Then he gave more. It, it, it got to the point where he's giving 50% of his income away. And God keeps blessing him. You can't outgive God. I read about a man that started a company and God blessed the company. He's the founder and CEO of this small private company. And he lives on 10%. He doesn't give away 10% to keep 90. He gives away 90 and lives on the 10. And that 10 is more than he needs. You can't outgive God. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. Who gets all the glory in you and God does? Verse 12, for the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, supplying the needs of Jenna and her friends when they go to Cyprus and Spain, supplying the needs of John and Sherry, supplying the needs of the Claw Witters, supplying the needs of the Papuses, and on and on and on. But it also is overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of the service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Verse 15, underline that. Thanks be to God for this inexpressible gift. Why did I have you note verse 15? Why did I end there? Notice it doesn't end with, Thanks, Doug, for your generous contribution of one penny. Thanks, Dale, for your faithfulness over the years and always giving faithfully to this church of yourself and your time and your money. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It says, thanks be to God. Who gets the thanks ultimately? Who deserves the acknowledgement? Who deserves the praise? It's right to thank people for their gifts and donations, but ultimately all the praise goes up to God for his inexpressible gift. What is God's inexpressible gift? Well, everything we have is from him. It said that in verse 11, you'll be enriched in every way in order to be generous in every way. But it's more than that, isn't it? It's verse 13, the gospel of Christ. If it wasn't for Jesus, the object of your faith, the means of your faith, the means of grace to have salvation, to have eternal life, to have access to God in heaven and all the reservoir of treasure and resources that come from God down into our lives, if it wasn't for Jesus, we would not have any access to this. We would be doomed. We would be paupers and beggars and have no hope in this world. You're on your own. Better hoard your pennies if that were the case. And be greedy. Like Terry. Sorry. That's just so funny. <laughs> you're not greedy. But you're greeting. No, thanks be to God for this inexpressible gift. If you've not yet put your faith in Jesus Christ, do it, please, right now. Just say, Lord, I put my faith in you. Jesus, take my life and make it be pleasing to you. You gave yourself to be a sacrifice for my sin. I put my faith and trust in you. Being saved is that simple. And then follow him every day. Give yourself to him and then follow him. He said, come, follow me. I'm going to tell you a story now. I've been so excited to tell you this. I read this story, I heard this story months ago, and I thought, someday I'm going to have the right sermon to tell you the story of the beggar's rice. So here it is. Here's a little cup of rice. Now, as the story goes, there was a very poor beggar in India. And all he had was a little cup of rice. He lived on a cup of rice a day. And each day, this very beautifully ornate chariot with beautifully groomed horses would go by, coming out of one of the palace gates. And it was, one of, it was a raja, one of the wealthy princes in India. And the beggar man stood on the side of the road as this beautiful chariot was going by. And he held out his bowl of rice as if to say, all I have is this bowl of rice. Would you please 
give me something out of your abundance of wealth. And much to his shock and surprise, the chariot stopped right in front of him. And the very well-dressed prince steps down out of the chariot, stood in front of the beggar, and looked at him and said, Give me some of your rice. Well, the beggar was silent for a moment. He was shocked. He, he didn't know what to say, and he's processing this and thought, How dare he ask me for my rice? This is all I have. I need something from him, and he's asking me for my rice? And the prince just stood there. And so very slowly, he reached down and carefully picked up one grain and put it in the hand of the prince. And the prince said, give me more of your rice. What? Are you kidding me? All these thoughts are going through his mind. Fine, here, here's another grain. Take it. And then third time, give me more. Well, now he's so angry, he's seething. He can't even look at the guy. He takes the smallest little dirty grain he can find and throws it in his hand and turns away in disgust and anger, seething, anger. How dare he insult me this way? I thought you were going to give me something. And you mock me in my poverty. And as he's walking away in anger, he glances down and the sunlight reflects something golden glinting in his cup. And he looks and he moves his finger around and he sees one, two, three little flecks of gold. You see, for every grain of rice he gave, the prince gave him one grain of gold. And it was at that point he wished he had given the prince all of his rice. You see, we're like that beggar. And we have a bowl of rice. And we hold on to it greedily. And we don't want to give it up. God is saying, give it all to me and I'll bless you. Now that's not to mean that we write a check for everything in our bank account and then we have overdraft fees because we can't pay our rent. No, I mean, there's a principle here though. And you understand. I think you get it. You've heard the old saying, you can't take it with you, which is true. But you can pay it forward. You can send it ahead. You can send it ahead in this life for the next one. And guess, guess what? Up there it gets changed into gold. When it goes through the refiner's fire, it doesn't burn up like it talks about in 1 Corinthians 3. It'll last forever and be for the praise and glory of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. We all get to celebrate it. At the end of uh, the outline there in your program, I wrote the treasure principle in quotes. Um, that comes from the title of this book by Randy Alcorn called The Treasure Principle. I took a couple ideas out of it. But this is a hundred pages chock full of great insight, scriptural insight. I believe one of the best written books I've seen on giving and the principles behind it. Um, this fellow, Randy Elkhorn, if you're not familiar with it, went through terrible trials to get to the place where he understood these principles. And you can read about it yourself. I actually have ordered a case of these. I could get a huge discount by getting a box of them for our church. So um, soon, hopefully even this week, we'll have a box of these. If you want to borrow one, and read it, pass it on. Um, they'll be available for you. So I want you to read those about the treasure principle. Luke 6.38 is where the treasure principle comes out of, at least in this book. Luke 6.38 will end with, it says this, Give. There you go, I said it. Give. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And if you understand God's principle, when we give God our cup of rice, this is probably about a cup, 
He gives it back to you by the barrel full. Now, there's a lot of verses in the Bible about giving and money. Jesus talked a lot about it, kind of like he talked a lot about hell. Um, One of them is in Hebrews 13 where it says, Keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. And then he ends it with this, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Why did he say that there? I think that if we really believe that his promises are true and that he'll never leave you or forsake you, then we can learn to be content and not let money be our master. But we have to believe that Jesus is enough. Of course, in Jesus' time when he went through the temple and found all the money changers, they were there for profit. They were greedy. Terry's not really greedy. The money changers in the temple were greedy. They were there for financial gain, taking advantage of the religious system. And you know that story in Matthew 21. Jesus went through and cleaned up, kicked them out, made whips and cords, and he got angry. He got royally, divinely ticked off, and he overturned tables. Didn't make many friends that day. You see, that's a picture of what he wants to do in your heart. When we let him in, he doesn't just want to sit in, in the living room and be served a cup of tea. He wants full access to the whole house, the chambers of your heart. And he'll go through and turn things over and open doors and look in cabinets and peer in the corners and look at your bank account. Will you give him that kind of access because he loves you and wants you to have the right motive so that you can be blessed than to be a blessing? So let him have that. Let him have everything. Realize that it's all his anyways. You know, it's easy to say that. We say that a lot. Yeah, it's all God's. But yet we go and do what we want when we want. And it doesn't mean that we can't enjoy ourselves and have a nice dinner or have some entertainment or go on a vacation. But let's be mindful of from where the blessing comes and give him praise and glory. And maybe it'll make us be a little more generous along the way. I'm just going to throw this out. This is not planned or premeditated, if you're feeling compelled to practice this, we have a good ministry here called the Mercy Fund, which is um, never filled up with lots of money in it because we use it to help people who have genuine needs. And if you just want to start off today with a little practice to give back to God, and if you, you'll, this isn't the only way you can give. This is just one option. If you do want to write a check and uh, give it to Dick Oyster, our treasurer, and just put Mercy Fund. Small or large, that's between you and God. Just know that that goes 100% to people in need in our community as needs become known, and we try to research those and make sure it's genuine and not a scam and try to use that wisely. We use it wisely. We don't use it, we don't just throw it around. That's just an option for you. But there's lots of ways to give. And um, I just wanted to throw that out to you. But let's practice giving and using this treasure principle. And let's see what God will do in your life and in this church. Because we can't outgive God. He gave himself to us. So let's give ourselves. You know, I was thinking, if we can trust God with our eternal life, if you can have faith and believe that you have eternal life, you are trusting God with your soul Think about it. Can you not trust him with your bank account? Right? We'll end with that. Let's pray. God in heaven, thank you so much. You gave yourself fully to us so that we would not have to perish, but instead we can have everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who gave himself away completely. And so, Lord, we don't want to hoard our mere pennies. What we have is nothing compared to eternity. There's nothing here worth hanging on to that's going to keep us further away from you. So help us to loosen our grip and recognize all we have is from you and be generous and see for ourselves, each one of us, that you really do want to bless us back and we might be amazed at what you do to help some get out of debt or 
uh, reach some other goal, or to be generous simply because there's needs out there and there's people hurting and we can help address those needs and then see that you'll supply even more to us so that we in turn can be even more generous. All the while, you promise to meet all of our needs. So I pray for everyone here, Lord, that you would meet their needs if they're struggling. Thank you, Lord, for giving to us. Now we want to give ourselves to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.